morning and welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church of Prescott Valley, Arizona on this second Sunday in the season of Lent. We are delighted that you are here and now might be a good time to pause the video to go to our website at emmanuellutheranpv.org to download our order of worship so that you can follow along with all the words to the litanies as well as the songs. So uh, we invite you to gather with us on this blessed day for we gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer, amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, Pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's love never fails. The promise rests on grace by the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Journey on the way of Jesus, amen. Please join us in singing our opening hymn, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. And so let us pray. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Now it's time for the children to shine for the children's message. Today's Old Testament lesson talks about Abram and Sarai. Abram is 99 years old. He's a pretty old guy and he has not had any kids. But God has told Abram that he will be fruitful and have kids and he promises that Sarah will have a baby boy so that they can be the patriarchs and matriarchs of a whole nation of people. Multitudes, it says in the text. Do you know what that kind of means? It kind of means all of us are related. Maybe we are actually cousins by a hundred years or hundreds of generations past. So maybe you and I are cousins. It's pretty easy to think about being children of God. And so when we're brothers and sisters in Christ and brothers and sisters with Jesus, because God has claimed us as God's own. And so we remember in our baptism when we were marked with the cross of Christ forever on our forehead, that that made us part of God's big family. 
And so we're kind of like cousins. Nice to meet you, relative. Let's remember that we are always God's children, and because of that, brothers and sisters in Christ. So let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for reminding us that we're all related because you, we are your kids. Help us to treat each other like relatives, being nice to each other when we can remember, and reaching out helping hands to everyone. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's kids say, Amen. And now our reading from Genesis, beginning with the 17th chapter. As with Noah, God makes an everlasting covenant with Abraham and Sarah. God promises this old couple that they will be the ancestors of nations, though they have no child together. God will miraculously bring forth new life from Sarah's womb. The name changes emphasize the firmness of God's promise. Beginning with the first verse. When Abraham was 99 years old and the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading comes to us from Mark, the eighth chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world 
and forfeit their life. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Dear Mother, Father, Creator of the universe, be present as we proclaim your word. May we be given hearts eager to follow your Son, Jesus, bold enough to follow him all the way to the cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Being a follower isn't something that we encourage in America. No college commencement speaker has ever congratulated the graduates on becoming the followers of tomorrow. Nobody makes epic biographical history films about great world followers. Nobody gives awards to recognize the contributions of community followers. Nobody frames their resume to highlight where they have exercised strong followship skills in their work. Nobody's heart swells with pride when another parent comes to them and says, you know, your kid's a really good follower. In fact, when following comes up at all, it's usually negative. Don't be a follower, be a leader. Don't follow the crowd. Being a follower is seen to be weak and passive. It's for people who can't act or think for themselves. Being a follower is for losers. There's only one place I know that we're encouraged to become a follower today, on Twitter. Twitter is all about following. It's an online social networking service and you connect with other people by choosing to follow them. That's the language it uses. So if you're following someone, you receive everything they say through Twitter. So choosing who to follow requires some real thought. Is this person interesting or funny or insightful or are they just going to tell you what breakfast cereal they had this morning? Whose thoughts and activities do you really want to keep up with? I personally do not have a Twitter account, but a friend told me recently about something that happened to him on his Twitter account. He said that when you open up your account, over in the corner of the screen, there's this box entitled, Who to Follow. It's always there when you log in. It contains the names and pictures of people that Twitter thinks that you might want to follow. And each one of them has this little button marked follow that you can just click on to start following them. One day, Twitter went uh, beyond being a social networking service and became an online evangelist when it said that he should follow Jesus Christ. Literally, it was right there. A Twitter feed for Jesus Christ with his picture and everything. <laughs> He's a pastor. What was he supposed to do? Not follow Jesus Christ? So he clicked the button next to the name and marked follow, and now he gets regular updates from Jesus Christ, which are sometimes funny, sometimes provocative, and often insightful. Not all that different from the Jesus that we follow in Scripture when you come to think about it. If there were Twitter in the first century, the real Jesus probably would have been pretty popular. Lots of people wanted to follow him to see what he was doing and hear what he had to say. By the time this story happens, Jesus has made quite a name for himself. He's been barnstorming the countryside on a streak of healings and exorcisms and other miracles. He's been saying a lot of things that are sometimes funny, sometimes provocative, and often insightful. And the crowds follow him and listen to everything he says and does. And of course, he's got a closer group of followers, the disciples. Now the word disciple simply means student, but Jesus' students are not too doing too well in his class. <laughs> They've been following him all over. They've seen everything he's done and heard everything he said, but 
They can't seem to master the course material. This scene is about halfway through the Gospel of Mark, so I guess you could say this was the midterm exam. Jesus wants to know how much of all this they've been getting so far. Who do you say I am, Jesus asks. And somehow something clicks for Peter and he actually comes up with the right answer. You are the Messiah, he simply says, and he passes the test. But you can have the right answers and still not understand anything about it. Just a few verses after he gave Jesus the correct answer, Peter is pulling Jesus aside to tell him that he has the wrong one. He begins to tell Jesus to stop talking about the Messiah having to suffer and be rejected and killed. What kind of Messiah is that, Peter demands. But Jesus cuts him off. Get behind me, Satan, he says. Now Jesus isn't calling him Satan lightly. Remember that Jesus began his ministry with Satan beside him, tempting him to see what kind of Messiah he really would be. It seems that here Jesus, too, has to take a midterm exam, facing that temptation again. And he, too, passes the test. And then he calls the crowds and the disciples around him, and he gives them all the answer to the question about what kind of Messiah he really will be, what kind of Messiah they are following. If anyone wants to become my followers, he says, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who have lost their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. Following Jesus requires a lot more than clicking a button and keeping up with him knowing what he says and does. It means actually going where he goes and doing what he does the way he does it, which is crucial given how the phrase take up their cross has been abused. Usually when people say something or someone is my cross to bear, they mean suffering that's imposed on them, but which may be accepted and endured without complaint. But that's not what Jesus is saying. We do not take up our cross and follow Jesus by quietly accepting and enduring the violence of a spouse or manipulations of a drug-addicted child. Suffering that is imposed on us against our will is not redemptive. Suffering on the cross was not imposed on Jesus. He took it upon himself willingly, intentionally, to redeem all of us. To take up our cross and follow Jesus means we follow him in refusing to think only about ourselves, but to suffer for the redemption of others, even if it means risking losing our lives. Losing our lives for the sake of the gospel does not always mean death, but it does mean a kind of martyrdom. Now we think of martyrs as people who died for their faith, who literally lost their lives for the sake of Christ and the gospel. But that's not the original meaning of the word martyr. It's a Greek word that simply means witness. And what does a witness do? A witness tells the truth of what they have seen and heard no matter what. It's just that. In the first three centuries of the church, telling the truth about what you had seen and heard about Jesus saving grace in your life in the world was enough to get you killed. But the significance wasn't actually in losing your life for your faith. The significance was in being a witness who gives testimony that you have already lost your life when Christ claimed it, and that it's held safely in Christ's hands where no one on earth can reach it. I've been told that at the height of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, Archbishop Desmond Tutu used to gather his staff around him in the mornings for prayer. And often as he was closing, he would ask, if being Christian were a crime, 
What would be enough evidence to convict us? He was asking this to keep himself and his staff focused on who and whose they were, rather than just what they were doing. They were not simply leaders, leading an important social struggle for dignity and freedom. They were followers, following Jesus Christ and insisting that God's reconciling love transcends anything that tries to resist it, which apartheid challenged in insisting that different races could not and should not live together. Without being followers, being leaders was not enough. People had to be able to see and hear them following Jesus in their lives and ministry for that leadership to really make sense in the first place. Every congregation should be a center for Christian fellowship, a place where we help each other become losers, losers of anything that keeps us from following Jesus, losing our fears and anxieties our pasts or our futures, our status or our schedules, our need to be in, in control of our lives and our faith, anything that keeps us from losing ourselves in the abundance of the grace that we receive, the love that we share, the ministry that we fulfill as followers of Christ. So as it turns out, we have a lot to lose. So let's get going. All we have to do is follow the leader, Jesus. Amen. Please join us in singing the hymn of the day, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. So let us pray. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all those in need. Your gift of grace is for all people, O oh God. Give confident faith to all the baptized that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. All the ends of the earth worship you, from galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities that we cannot even imagine. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. In Jesus, you join humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your, to all the depth of your love, love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving, especially those affected by the global pandemic. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. You made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. 
Bless grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Equip ministries and services to families, especially our mission partner, Child Haven. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Please offer now any other prayers you may have, either silently or aloud. We await the day of Christ's coming in glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. We entrust ourselves and all of our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered together as God's people, we share the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we give thanks for the offerings that we have received in the mail, online, and in person this past week. These gifts make it possible for us to continue to be the church in the world, even when we can't meet in our sanctuary. If you're worshiping with us today and would like to make a donation, please go to our website homepage and click on the online giving link. And so let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you've blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, and your Son, Jesus. Use us and what we have gathered to show the world your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And so, dear ones, hear this blessing. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you, and may you be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Please join us in our sending hymn, Be Thou My Vision. So friends, go in peace, share the good news. Thanks be to God.